Hi everybody, today we're going to be talking about DBT or dialectical behavior therapy, which is traditionally thought of to be used when working with uh, patients with borderline personality disorders, although more recently it's expanded to um, work with pe patients with other types of behavioral um, disorders, including forensic populations, which we'll talk about a little bit toward the end of the lecture. So. DBT was developed in large part because traditionally we've had very little success in working with um, individuals with personality disorder. So patients with personality disorder typically come to therapy with presenting problems other than personality problems. So they'll have difficulty you know, in their relationships, etc. And it's only after kind of working with them for several sessions that you kind of recognize that something else is going on. And they usually require much more work within the session. There's much more interpersonal many more interpersonal issues between you and the client. Um, the treatment usually lasts longer, it's a greater strain on your skill and your patients, and there's greater difficulty in treatment compliance. One of the most challenging disorders um, to, to work with um, is borderline personality disorder, or BPD. I know a lot of um, colleagues who, when they're screening for their private practices, if somebody says they have BPD, they'll actually not take them because in many cases they're not equipped because these patients often have high needs. They may be high risk if they're engaging in self-harm or suicidal behaviors. And so for them, um, it's a quality of life issue in terms of maintaining their caseload, but also they may not be the best equipped and there are programs specifically designed to work with patients with BPD. So some of the diagnostic features of BPD are hypersensitivity to abandonment, um, and so as a therapist, you're, they're always very sensitive to cues that you're letting off if you're going to be rejecting them, etc. They have a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, so they're many times getting into fights. And you'll see this also in your, um, your relationship with them as a therapist. There are many times they're going to come to therapy and you're going to be the best thing that ever happened to them, and other times you'll be the worst therapist ever. And you'll see that they often have a history of many different therapy starts and stops. They have an unstable self-image or sense of self. Um, they don't know who they are, or kind of where they're headed in life oftentimes. There's marked impulsivity in many domains. Um, so some of it might look like kind of a manic episode where they're buying things as sexual behavior oftentimes, substance use. A, a very uh, you know, diagnostic uh, feature is recurrent suicidal behavior, although this doesn't happen in all patients um, who have BPD, but many of them will have multiple suicide attempts. Um, there's a lot of affective instability. Um, such that they can become really happy one moment, really sad the next, really angry very quickly. So their emotions change dramatically. You may see that even over the course of one session. There are chronic feelings of emptiness. Um, so underneath a lot of this stuff, you'll see oftentimes some very severe depression and just feelings of emptiness and abandonment. Inappropriate or intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. So this is where they often end up in, in contact with the criminal justice system because they will do um, sometimes some extreme behaviors. Um, and they can be violent, especially if they have been, kind of feel as if they've been abandoned or they're in a, in a domestic dispute. And there can be transient stress-related paranoia, paranoid ideation or dissociative symptoms. You'll also see um, about 70% of patients with BPD will have um, some self-harm behaviors that are non-suicidal in nature, so deliberate self-harm, usually cutting or burning. Although they can be more serious and depending on the severity of the disorder, um, you know, I've seen things such as eye inoculation, um, people cutting themselves, and then a, a colleague of mine actually had a, a patient who would, um, you know, stick food items up her vagina until they would rot. She had cuts that she would open up and put food in there to rot. So there's a touch of psychosis along with the, the borderline um, personality disorder going on there. So about 2% of the general population meet criteria for BPD with 11% of all outpatients and 19% of all inpatients meeting criteria for this disorder. Of those who do have some personality disorder, 33% of outpatients and 63% of inpatients meet criteria for BPD. And I think one of the reasons for that is just because the behaviors oftentimes are very extreme and they land them in contact with the, the medical system because of um, you know, the fact that they're hurting themselves and therefore they end up in psychiatric care versus somebody who is narcissistic, for example, or schizoid may not come in contact with the mental health system because they're kind of content in living their, their, their life. 70 to 75% of BPD patients have a history of self-injurious acts. 
and its um, suicide rates for patients with BPD is approximately 10%, so it's 10% completed suicide. So that's where we have to be mindful because you know suicide risk among this population, even though suicide is sometimes used for different purposes other than wanting to die, but sometimes it can be fatal, and one in 10 is, is really a very high rate. And 74% of BPD um, patients who are referred are women. Some argue this is a gender stereotype in that we you know, associate a lot of these behaviors um, with pathology in women and they're more acceptable in men. And sometimes um, there's some evidence that suggests that men manifest some of the symptoms of BPD differently and so it's more you know, externalizing behavior like the violence that we see in the population. So Marsha Linehan, um, she's out of the University of Washington, she is the pioneer and she developed borderline personality disorder. She kind of felt um, personally that she was seeing clients who exhibited a lot of these symptoms and traditional cognitive behavioral therapy wasn't sufficient and they weren't addressing a lot of the key issues. Simultaneously, she was also doing her own study of Buddhism and she really enjoyed um, some of the, the Eastern philosophies and so she felt like that combining the two was really um, you know what she she wanted and so those of you who have the book or who have studied it notice that the, the book is called cognitive behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorder and that was because they felt like that was the best way to market it um, and so that's the name that has stuck but um, most of you probably have also heard of DBT the acronym for dialectical behavior therapy so according to Linehan's model, biological and environmental factors account for BPD. So BPD individuals are born with an emotional vulnerability, but they also grow up in um, emotionally invalidating environments. So you know it doesn't necessarily mean they had, um, you know, they didn't have resources because we see people across the, the socioeconomic spectrum who have this disorder. But for example, like if a child is crying instead of saying, you know, what's wrong? Well, why are you feeling sad? You know, the response might be, stop crying, That you don't need to cry, there's nothing for you to cry about. So there's really a disconnect between how they're feeling and, and how the environment is reacting to them. And so because they have this emotional vulnerability and this environment, invalidating environment, there's a reciprocal influence between their, their uh, biological vulnerability and the environment, which leads to a dysfunction in, in the emotion regulation system. So they really don't know how to deal with these emotions that they're having, and they tend to have more emotions. So the components of emotional dysregulation, their emotional vulnerability, their high sensitivity to emotional stimuli, intense response to emotional stimuli, and so to, slow to return to, to baseline once emotional arousal has occurred. So these, this is kind of like when you think about people with short fuses. So this is, you know, we, we talk about that when we refer to temper, and people with BPD may have extreme tempers, but it also refers to kind of sadness. Um, and so, you know, when they feel very sad, you know, self-harm and suicide are very much at the forefront because these are intense emotions. So whatever emotion they're feeling, even if it's if it's a positive emotion, the emotion is very intense and they're very quickly to rise and hard to, to kind of come back to baseline. And so they have deficits in emotional modulation strategies. So many of us learn how to control our emotions. Um, I'm noticing now with my three-year-old, he's experiencing a lot of emotions and we're working with him to kind of label those emotions and, and learn to control them because when he gets angry, he gets really angry. And patients with BPD often don't have those experiences because their emotions are un not validated. And therefore, um, they, you know, they don't recognize their own emotions or when they are recognized, they, they don't know how to cope with them effectively. So as a consequence of being a psychologist, my poor child is probably going the complete opposite direction and getting overvalidated for his emotions, but such is life as a child of a psychologist. Um, so people with BPD often have the inability to um, inhibit inappropriate behavior related to strong negative or positive emotions. They have the um, they don't have the ability to act in a way that's not mood dependent. Um, so whenever they're feeling a certain way, that's the way they can act. Like we know how to, you know, sometimes we can be upset, but we can function um, in a professional environment. People with BPD have a hard time doing that. They have a hard time self-soothing um, whenever any kind of, you know, there's any psychological arousal. So for me, my self-soothing technique is just get me a piece of cake and I'm feeling much better right away. And they have an ability to kind of refocus attention in the presence of strong emotional stimuli. So if they're feeling really emotional, they cannot focus on anything else, and that kind of the rationality goes out the window. So in terms of in invalidating environments, their emotions and struggles get trivialized, disregarded, ignored, or punished, even when they are in the normal sphere. Um, so non-extreme efforts to get help are ignored. So this is when, you know, like, they're asking for help, and so they're you know they they are neglected, and therefore they then 
proceed to get, you know, act up, and this is where you see children kind of doing this, if, you know, their immediate requests are not granted, and they start tantruming or whatever, and this is how people with BPD learn to get a response from their environment, be it positive or negative. And so only these extreme communications are taken seriously. And in many instances, we often see a part of this invalidating environment that people are sexually abused, especially by those around them. And even if the abuse is found out about, that people don't necessarily take it seriously or don't validate the trauma that's resulted from this. So therefore, BPD individuals learn to invalidate themselves. They're intolerant of their own emotions and struggles, and therefore they punish, suppress, and judge their own emotions, even when they are normal. They feel easily invalidated by others, so their feelings often get hurt, and that's where they're kind of the oversensitivity or the hypersensitivity comes from. And they still influence others by extreme behaviors, which is the self-injury, the suicidality to get help, the aggression, self-injury, or suicidality to get others to back off. So some of the consequences of the invalidating environment are the child fails to learn how to label emotions or modulate emotional arousal. They fail to learn to tolerate distress or form realistic goals and expectations. They learn that extreme emotional reactions will sometimes provoke a helpful environmental response. So if they're feeling neglected, if they do something, like such as cut themselves or make a suicide attempt, that people will come running and help them, which is what they're ultimately after, is having people show that they love and care about them. And it's only these extreme emotions that are provoking that. And the child fails to learn to trust their own internal experiences and hence look for external cues on how to think, feel, and act. So there's really no barometer of their emotional experiences for them. So um, I personally view DBT as an extension of CBT, and I don't view them as diametrically opposed. Like, for example, if somebody tells me their theoretical orientation is DBT, to me they're saying my theoretical orientation is CBT because the principles are the same. There are just certain techniques that are emphasized more um, when working with a specific treatment or population. However, other people view it somewhat differently, um, and obviously that's up to you. But there are some areas of divergence from standard CBT. So there's the emphasis on acceptance and validation of behavior as it is in the moment rather than kind of change. So while CBT is more, you know, change focused, um, DBT does a lot more validation and acceptance. We're not talking about it in this class, but there's a, another therapy that's designed by Steve Hayes, which is called acceptance and commitment therapy, which focuses a lot on, it's also kind of a mindfulness-based theory and, and about being in the here and the now and, and accepting your emotions while changing at the same time. DBT also emphasizes the importance of balancing the technology of change with the technology of acceptance. I would argue that a good CBT therapy provider also does this, but um, it's more explicit in DBT. And there's an emphasis on treating therapy interfering behaviors of both the client and the therapist. And this is actually you know, not something that's not done in CBT, but something that's put a lot more emphasis on in DBT, especially um, therapist interfering behaviors. You'll We'll talk about the structure of DBT, but there's actually a special group for therapists that participate in and you address therapist interfering behaviors. Um, you know, the emphasis on the therapeutic relationship is essential to treatment, which, as we have already discussed, is part of CBT, and then the uh, emphasis in the dialectical process, which we'll discuss momentarily. So some of the characteristics of DBT treatment is that it applies many standard CBT principles and techniques. It attempts to reframe suicidal and other dysfunctional behaviors, and so you explain to them the, the, the model that we just discussed, kind of in the role of these extreme behaviors and how these behaviors are being used by the individual in order to kind of get what they were missing in childhood. And that kind of helps people a lot because it helps them understand um, where they're coming from and why they're doing what they're doing because many times people don't understand their behaviors and so understanding it kind of in context helps people a lot and it helps you know motivate them for change adopts a new a problem solving focus ex encourages exposure to fear eliciting stimuli and emphasizes strategies for validating clients thoughts feelings and actions because that's kind of repairing what was missing from their childhood in many cases there's also an emphasis on modifying current maladaptive behaviors before ameliorating long-standing interpersonal conflicts. So basically there are different stages of DBT and before you can go on to deal with issues such as abuse and neglect in childhood which are extremely painful, the individual has to be stabilized so they can't be actively suicidal, they can't be engaging in self-harm behaviors because if a patient is destabilized by talking about things that are really traumatic you're going to destabilize them further and so they have to have appropriate coping techniques. And so it combines therapy in two conceptual components, psychosocial skills training and motivational issues, which we'll discuss. There are some key assumptions to DBT um, that you go over with your clients. One is the person is doing the best that they can. 
Two is that the person always wants to improve, even if it doesn't always seem like they do, because sometimes they're going to have therapy interfering behaviors that work against them. But this is kind of part of the conceptualization of DBT is these, you kind of undermine yourself. Um, three is the person needs to do better, try harder, and be more motivated for change. And so you can see that one and three are kind of diametrically opposed, but that's the dialectic of DBT, that, you know, while you're at the one hand, you're doing the best that you can, on the other hand, you need to be trying harder. While the person may not cause all their own problems, they have to solve them anyway. Um, and I think this is kind of key, and that's just kind of part of life. Unfortunately, many of the problems that arise in our lives we do not cause, but we have to work on solving them. The lives of emotionally dysregulated individuals are unbearable as they're currently being lived. And I think this is key to keeping people in therapy because many times, you know, people don't know why they want to be in therapy. and. Um, you know, the reason that they've come is because they can't stand living the way they are and they're, you know, they're talking about killing themselves. And if your life is that bad, you know, being here, you're, you're here because you want to make it better. People must learn new behaviors in all relevant contexts of their life. You cannot fail in DBT. Um, so no matter what you do, you cannot fail. It is only by a lack of showing up and trying that, that you know, the therapist can fail you technically. Um, Staff treating emotionally dysregulated people needs support because it's very emotionally draining and a person is not fragile. So um, Marsha Linehan uses a lot of irreverence in her work. I mean, I think this is kind of a personality specific trait, but she encourages people in DBT to use irreverence. And so, you know, oftentimes we tiptoe around really de delicate things like suicide. And, you know, we have to think that, that people can handle talking about such things and it's only by talking about them that we're going to make them better. So these are just two, on the left hand side is cognitive behavioral um, therapy, um, so this kind of demonstrates the dialectic of DBT which has change, problem solving, rationality, and logic, and then you have, it's kind of the yin and the yang. On the other hand you have the Zen practice which is acceptance, validation, intuition, and paradox. And while these things might seem diametrically opposed, they often work together very nicely because we know that as human beings we have multiple facets to ourselves. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, we want to be rational, but on the other hand, we can be irrational. And that's just kind of accepting all of that. Um, in DBT, there's a hierarchy of treatment targets, and these are very much, um, you know, something that you have to follow if you're following a DBT protocol. And this is where you see problems um, with people who are not following the protocol, and why patients can sometimes get destabilized in treatment because they're not adhering to the, the, the hierarchy of treatment targets. Um, for example, number one is decreasing suicidal behaviors because if you're not alive, you can't come to treatment. Decreasing therapy interfering behaviors such as, you know, not doing your homework, not talking in treatment, you know, arguing with the therapist, things like that. Decreasing behaviors that interfere with quality of life. These can be, you know, cutting yourself. These can be substance abuse, promiscuity, things that are interfering with your general quality of life. Increasing behavioral skills that teach you how to, to cope more efficiently decreasing behaviors related to post-traumatic stress, um, improving self-esteem, and then individually negotiating targets with the client. So many times, you know, a focus of DBT is largely going to focus with items one, two, three, and four, and it's only, you know, much later in treatment that people are looking at items five, six, and seven. Um, you know, I've seen what has happened when I worked on an inpatient unit is that many times the staff want to talk to patients about their, that the clients want to talk about their abuse because that's what they're feeling acutely. And so staff will talk about that with them, which then further dysregulates them because they can't handle their emotions and then they'll make more suicide attempts, they'll cut, etc. And so it kind of has to be negotiated. The entire environment agrees to this policy and this hierarchy that nobody talks about any of those, those things until, you know, items one through five, or sorry, one through four are kind of out of control. So there are different modes of treatment in DBT using a true DBT model, although a lot of it has been adjusted depending upon the environment. So there are three, um, actually four main components to a true, true DBT program. The first is group skills training. So this would be where a group of individuals who have these um, types of behaviors meet for two and a half hours per week and they go through the skills training manual. Um, this is the, the smaller red book that Marsha Linehan has produced. Um, people can go through the manual multiple times. These are kind of 
generally open groups and people can come in at various points and continue until they've completed all the, the modules and oftentimes they go through the modules multiple times. In addition to being in group therapy, people have to be in individual therapy. In individual therapy, you're working on you know the chain analyses of the different behaviors, therapy, therapy interfering behaviors, and you're also working with the client to coach them on using the skills that they learn in group training. Um, so the therapist can be the same for group and individuals, and sometimes they're different individuals as well. Telephone consultation is available um, to help with skills training and coaching. And this is where I kind of put my foot down in terms of my availability as a therapist. You know, I need for my own sanity to have a, uh, you know, a distinction between home and work. And to me, being on call 24 hours a day for my client just doesn't work. Um, but people who are participating in DBT programs, that's one of the things that they agree to, is that they agree to be on call for their clients. Sometimes it might not be their own therapist, as people might work an on-call schedule. But basically, if a client is feeling distressed in this model, they are free to call day or night their therapist or whoever is on call, and that person, as long as the person has not made a suicide attempt or cut themselves yet or done anything you know, um, that would be a therapy interfering behavior, that person will work with them, coach them through, and help them use their skills. Um, if the client has made a suicide attempt or has cut, um, the therapist will then you know, call 911 or tell them that they need to then do a behavior chain analysis in the, in the following session, depending on the severity of the behavior. Um, at that point, you wouldn't reinforce that behavior because if you think about the model, that's how people got reactions in the past. So you do not encourage that. So you basically would you know, assess the situation and then make a call to 911 and the person would be hospitalized. They also encourage um, hospitals when working with patients with DBT to release those patients as soon as possible because some people get reinforced by the hospital environment. You want to medically stabilize them and then release them. In addition, all therapists who engage in DBT should participate in case consultation on a weekly basis to um, make sure that they're on track, but also to, to do a lot of self-care, to, to talk about different cases and different issues that arise, and to, to practice mindfulness and some of the skills themselves. So there are various, um, there are four main stages of treatment, which is separate to the four modalities. Um, the first stage is pretreatment or commitment. So before you begin therapy, this can be actually a therapy of itself. You're using motivational enhancement techniques like motivational interviewing or commitment strategies as they call them in DBT to get people to agree to participate in DBT and to agree to all the rules. So you tell them explicitly what they need to expect and once they commit, they're committed. Um, the second stage is stage one where they're focusing on suicidal behaviors and therapy interfering behaviors. So this is where they're participating in the, the group therapy and the individual therapy. Stage two, once they have stabilized themselves, is that you can focus on PTSD-related problems and their trauma. Um, and those would be using techniques similar to the ones that you talk about when we talked about um, you know, anxiety disorders and the treatment of PTSD, like exposure-based techniques, coping strategies, etc. And then stage three is really quality of life issues and focusing on self-esteem and individual treatment goals. I very rarely see people with BPD um, in stages two and three. Oftentimes we'll still see them in stages, um, stage one um, because many of the, you know, they've had this pattern of behaviors for their long standing and it's hard to progress to stages two and three. And stages two and three don't necessarily need somebody who is trained in DBT. They can go for a regular kind of treatment to address once they're kind of stable and under control and have the basic coping strategies. Those can then be applied when they're dealing with those things. So in pre-treatment pre or commitment, people are you're identifying the goals of the client. You have a clear and thorough discussion of what therapy can involve and why. You have a collaborative discussion of what can be done to help the client meet their goals. Um, you have to have an illicit, an explicit and firm commitment to specific behaviors such that they will stop doing these things if they, you know, if they want to participate, you know, in DBT. And then you want to use the devil's advocate strategy, like highlight the disadvantages of committing, such as, are you sure you don't have to? And so you want the person to kind of be motivated themselves and come up with all the reasons that they themselves want to be in treatment. And if they're not committed, then you still, you, you continue kind of with different commitment strategies and motivational interviewing techniques in order to get them to commit. So by the end of the first session, you want to get them to commit to no suicide before the next session and having them remove any lethal means from their apartment or wherever they live. 
by the end of the fourth session, you want long-term commitment to no suicide, long-term commitment to no self-harm, working on therapy interfering behaviors, um, to do a diary card, which we'll talk about momentarily in therapy homework, to engage in regularly structured productive activities, and to work on not avoiding everything. So this is kind of what you're ending, you're looking to get from the patient in this pre-commitment type phase. Your commitment to the patient is you're gonna to commit to four sessions to decide if you can help the client, and for the client to decide if he or she will commit to therapy. So by telling a client that you're gonna decide if you can help them, makes it seem more desirable to them and it's it's often a strategy kind of using the, de the dialectic to get them more engaged by saying well maybe i can help you instead of saying oh i can definitely help you gets the person to make them want, want it more by the end of the fourth session you make a time limited commitment to them for example one year so for one year you have to stick with them through thick and thin um, and specify progress required for you to agree to additional therapy after that time period ends so if you know you say like well i'll do it for one year at that point if you've been suicide attempt free and you're no longer self-harming at that point we can negotiate six month periods again by doing this you're making it seem somewhat desirable and you're having the person really committed to to wanting to do this so in individual therapy you're establishing rapport with your clients so that you have a good relationship with them you're working on the diary cards you're doing behavior chain analyses whenever they engage in therapy interfering behaviors or they've done something to hurt themselves, like a suicide attempt or a self-harm attempt, and you're addressing therapy interfering behaviors, such you know things that um, are going on that's preventing them from fully be um, you know participating in treatment. So this is a diary card. I've put a few samples in your contents folder for the DBT lecture. Um, in addition. Um, you know, you can get a lot of these online. There are various different forms of this type of diary card. So what this is, is kind of similar to a DTR in that they're monitoring um, their behaviors. Um, here you see it's done every day, and so you ha they have to monitor a variety of different emotions, such as sad, mad, glad, bad, anxious, conscious, lonely, empty, pert, and then as well as their urges to purge, drink, isolate, lie, obsess, self-injure, or make suicide attempts. And these can be monitored based upon the needs of your client. Um, you know, some people may have other emotions or behaviors that they engage in which you could add to this. And so they have to note these on each day and how bad they were. And we do want to know if they've made any kind of, you know, suicide attempt or self-injury um, or they've uh, done any kind of, like, for example, if you're doing DBT for eating disorders, that would be the target behavior and you would do a diary card or a behavior chain, sorry, a behavior chain analysis for that, which we'll talk about momentarily. You then have a list of skills. Um, sometimes these are two pages. This is all on one page. And you check the... Um, the skills that you did use, skills that you tried but didn't work, or skills that you think you could have used on those days. And we'll go through some of these, otherwise they are described um, in the skills training manual that you can purchase. So a behavior chain analysis is a behavioral technique where you go through um, the precipitating event and what led to the eventual problem behavior like the suicide attempt. So there's usually a chain of thoughts, feelings, and emotions that have gone into that. And um, what we're trying to do is to show the patient where they could have intervened with different types of skills. And you have, this is very much a patient-generated activity so that your patient is really coming up with this. So you figure out the problem. So they cut themselves, they purged, they drank alcohol. They, it's usually a self-harm type of behavior. They made a suicide attempt. Um, and here there's not a lot of coddling. So this is more like, you know, you don't want to reinforce the, the behavior that they have traditionally used to get attention. And so you, it's done in a very method, methodical kind of process and very much to the fact. And you conduct a behavior chain analysis where you look at vulnerabilities, precipitating events, interpretations, antecedents, links, and consequences. And you analyze the chain of events and figure out where the train came off the track. So for example, the ultimate behavior problem may be um, a suicide attempt and it happened because um, you know you got stood up on a date so the precipitating event would be that you were stood up on a date you then had the thought that nobody loves me as a consequence you went out and you got drunk which then made you disinhibit your behaviors 
you then started being flooded with thoughts of what's the point, there's no reason to live anymore. Um, you then walked and got medications in your cabinet and you overdosed on your medications making a suicide attempt. And so you can see kind of how that chain of events led to the suicide attempt. Then you want to generate solutions and new behaviors. So you want to look at that chain and see where you could have intervened. So, you know, when you were stood up on your date, you know that's a high risk situation for you. And you could have called somebody. Um, you know, later if you, if you didn't do that, you could have maybe not had medications in the house. Um, you know, you could have, instead of going and getting yourself drunk, you could have gone for a walk or a run instead because you know that's also effective for you. So here's a case example. Um, the person, the vulnerability factors was that it's a holiday experience. They're recently exposed to their, to their family, um, who they usually have arguments with. They were sleep deprived and there was a recent blow up with a roommate. So we can all imagine this type of situation. This is a situation where we're not definitely at our best. Um, recently, after a night of being up until 4 a.m., I know that I, I had an interaction which normally would not be particularly emotional for me. Um, but burst into tears when I was talking to somebody about something that you know was slightly emotional but clearly I overreacted. So we know that those kinds of things make us generally emotional reacted. So in this case um, a woman is disappointed in the morning when a guy she's interested in doesn't get back to her. Later she's upset that the guy she likes at work doesn't interact with her during her shift. She has a downward kind of spiral of thoughts. We all have those. She experiences intense emotion dysregulation. She passes a bar on the way to the train, decides to drink to alleviate emotional pain. She meets a guy at the bar and under the influences, goes home with him, does cocaine, and has unprotected sex. And while she's alleviated the emotional pain in the short term, the next day she experiences self-disgust, regret about wasting money when she doesn't even have money for rent, and significant depression. Um, and therefore, one of the consequences is that we have the patient identify the pros and cons of substance use and the pros and cons of not using and how that would have impacted the situation. So if you look at the solution, self-validation related to holidays being a hard time, um, mindfulness for upsetting thoughts, focusing attention on upcoming positive things and mastery experiences to replace the harmful, harmful thoughts, pros and cons thinking before entering the bar, not walking on the street where the bar she likes is located, observe, urge, and surf it, kind of that's a mindfulness technique, or call or text your therapist. So um, there are different kind of areas that are targeted in the skills training ones. Um, there are four main areas. There's mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness, which target four different areas. So commute, confusion about this themselves. I'm not sure of who I am or what I want in life. You can use mindfulness techniques. Impulsivity, I usually act quickly without, without thinking. You use distress tolerance techniques. Um, once I get upset, it takes me a long time to calm down. You use emotion regulation techniques. People who have a lot of interpersonal chaos, like many of my relationships have been full of intense arguments, can use interpersonal effectiveness techniques. So skills training rules. So groups have separate rules. Um, and all people who want to participate in the groups need to adhere to these rules. Otherwise, they're, they're, um, they can be kicked out of the group. So clients who drop out of therapy, individual therapy, or out of therapy, they can't come to skills training group anymore. And you can't drop in and out of therapy. Once you make the decision, you're out. And that's to kind of prevent people from being wishy-washy um, and reinforcing the fact that people can kind of make ultimatums, like, I'm going to leave if you don't do what I want. So if you leave, you're like, okay, good, but goodbye, you want to leave, you can leave, you're free to leave. Um, each ha client has to be in ongoing individual therapy. Clients can't come to session on drugs or alcohol. Clients are not to discuss parasuicidal behaviors with other clients outside of session because this can dysregulate other people. Clients who call one another for help when feeling suicidal must be willing to ex uh, accept help from that individual. Information obtained during session must, must remain confidential. Clients who are going to be late should call ahead. Clients may not, may not form private relationships outside of training sessions. Um, so, you know, depending on the group, you want to call the, the service provider and not necessarily other clients. Um, because, and if they're, they don't want clicks being formed in group because then people become felt feeling left out, etc. Although when you're working on inpatient units, this becomes difficult.
sexual partners may not be in skills training group together. As I showed you on the previous slide, there are four main skills training modules. Four seems to be the number here in DBT. There's core mindfulness. However, each session starts and finishes with a mindfulness exercise, regardless of whether you're in the core mindfulness module or not. Interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance. Clients will generally go through the groups numerous times. Um, you can ask clients to lead mindfulness exercises as you're going to be practicing in your blog exercise. Um, number five, and no self-harm or suicidal behavior is to be discussed in groups. That's for your individual therapy sessions, and that's because, as I mentioned, it dysregulates people. So this is a sample skills training cycle. So we'll do mindfulness for four weeks, emotion regulation for six weeks, mindfulness review for two weeks, interpersonal effectiveness six weeks, mindfulness review two weeks, and distress tolerance for six weeks. And so mindfulness, as you can see, is a very core part of DBT and something that's integrated throughout the entire uh, skills training process. So mindfulness is taught at the beginning of each of the modules. The focus of mindfulness is to increase one's awareness of the events, emotions, and behaviors. Um, you know, what I find and what you probably see yourself is that our lives are so busy and oftentimes we're not in the moment. And I've mentioned this earlier, but you know, we can be driving and we have no idea where we've even been. I mentioned the example of when I've eaten things and I didn't even realize that I ate them because they're gone so quickly. And so we have to learn to, to be more aware of what our, we're doing and be more in the moment, um, in the here and now. We also have to learn to do it in a focused and non-judgmental manner. And so we have a tendency, um, you know, and sort of be our cognitive distortions, to judge ourselves very harshly. Um, and therefore, in DBT, whenever you kind of have these negative thoughts, you kind of just focus on being in the here and now, focus on your breath, and you let the kind of the, the thoughts pass you by instead of as more actively in cognitive therapy, we would try to change them. Mindfulness kind of just has those thoughts float in and out of your consciousness. So mindfulness skills, as I mentioned, are central to DBT. So mindfulness emphasizes wise mind, which is the optimal balance between the logical analytical mind and the sometimes volatile emotional mind. So we don't want to be like a robot like Data, on the one hand being totally logical and um, you know, rational driven, but on the other hand being overly emotional and, and emotion being your sole focus is not good either. So you want to find balance between that because we want to have our rationality and think clearly, but at the same time we are you know, thinking, feeling we're human beings and it's important to balance those two. So wise mind is something that you'll often hear in DBT. Um, mindfulness skills include paying attention to the ebb and flow of emotional experiences, paying attention to your thoughts in the moment, paying attention to your actions and urges and practicing labeling them correctly, and accepting them without trying to suppress them. So oftentimes, we, you know, if we have negative thoughts or emotions, we try to push them out. And that's kind of some of the theory behind why people experience PTSD and some of the other anxiety disorders. So just kind of accepting them and having them flow, and not being judgmental of them, and then bringing our thoughts back to the present and the here and the now. Interpersonal effectiveness focuses on learning how to communicate one's needs effectively and dealing with interpersonal conflict. So as we talked about, people with BPD often have intense interpersonal relationships, and many of these is because they don't know how to handle um, interpersonal relationships effectively. They've learned to, you know, that this intensity can, in some cases, get what they want, but they don't know how the subtleties of communication, how to get what they want without these intense relationships. So one of these skills is called Dear Man. Um, many of you may have heard about this already, but that's where you describe um, what you want, you express yourself, you assert your wishes, and then you reinforce them. And you have to do this in a mindful way, you have to appear confident, and then you have to negotiate. So for example, um, you, you say to somebody, you know, um, Instead of kind of being judgmental of the situation, if you if your husband walk, if uh, walks in and says something to you that you don't like, you can say you know you describe the situation. When you come in and you tell me that you don't want to eat the dinner that I cooked, um, and then you express your feelings. Um, so you describe the situation in very non-judgmental terms. So just kind of just the facts, please, and you express how you feel. Um, you know, it makes me feel really sad and it makes me feel like you don't care about all the effort that I put into making this. So you tell what your feelings are, then you assert what you want. Um, and this is where you say, I would prefer it if you don't like my dinner, if you could at least try to take a few bites and then tell me, you know, that this isn't your favorite food. That would make me feel better. 
and then or so, sorry and then the reinforces that would make me feel better and it would be easier for me to handle the situation um, one is encouraged to use this as a broken record where you kind of go through this several times that the person doesn't you know appear to be listening to you and again in doing this you have to be mindful notice your feelings emotions and behaviors and use your skills and techniques in order to cope if you're not getting the the, what you want, you have to appear confident in what you're saying, but not appear emotional. And then if somebody disagrees, you have to negotiate and then kind of start again. Emotion regulation is about understanding emotions, learning how to reduce emotional vulnerability and decrease, decrease emotional suffering. So this is where you know we have to know our own feelings and how to cope with them, but also know situations in which we are vulnerable, like we talked about lack of sleep, or you know if there are times of the year that are difficult for you. So here we work on reducing emotional reactivity and sensitivity by encouraging our clients to exercise and eat and sleep, eat a balanced diet and sleep. Um, in some cases, using exposure therapy to kind of um, expose them to some intense emotions, but this would be only later on when they can handle this. You want to reduce the intensity of emotional episodes by um, you initially using de techniques such as distraction which is a less destructive form of avoidance, and then actually teaching them you know, increased um, coping techniques, increased emotional tolerance using mindfulness and block avoidance, and then act effectively despite emotional arousal. So ha having them behave in a way that you know, doesn't delay their, um, their emotional instability. So emotional regulation skills, we have to understand our emotions and their reactions. We want to observe our emotions, experience our emotions, because by suppressing our emotions, you know, we oftentimes, um, you know, that's what happened to many people with BPD. We don't understand them well. And we want to reduce emotional vulnerability through exercise and reducing drugs or alcohol intake. Distress tolerance increases one's ability to tolerate and survive crises and to accept life as it is in the moment. So life is going to be painful. We all know that sometimes. And so how do we handle that in a way that we do not become emotionally um, you know, destructive to ourselves. So there are a bunch of skills that you learn in the distress tolerance um, module, such as distraction techniques, self-soothing procedures, improve the moment, which we'll talk about, realistically evaluating the pros and cons, and then acceptance strategies. So improve um, is when you kind of use these different techniques in order to tolerate distress. You, don't, you can use them all at once or one at a time. Imagery, so you have like a happy place where you can put yourself. Meaning, so, so find, try to find meaning in the situation. Prayer for, the, for those for whom that works. Relaxation, so that would be some of the relaxation exercises that we've talked about. One thing in the moment, so kind of focus on one thing in the here and now. Do a mental vacation um, or use kind of, you know, self encouragement techniques. So here's just some outcome research and additionally I gave you an article to read but in 1991, this is kind of the original DBT article, Marsha Linehan assigned 24 subjects to DBT and 23 people to treatment as normal in a community control condition. Um, she had a very low attrition rate of only 17% which for this population is very low. Um, people got individual and group therapy weekly for one year and they had assessments at 4, 8, and 12 months. And she found that there were significantly fewer parasuicidal acts, um, almost all of the controls versus about two thirds of patients versus uh, for DBT, and there were also fewer acts um, of self harm. So 1.5 acts per year for those in the DBT condition versus nine for control. So that's a significant change in these self harming behaviors. During the last four months of treatment, 61.9% of the controls engaged in self harm acts whereas only one-third of those in DBT. So while about two-thirds of those in DBT did do self-harm, much of that came earlier on in treatment, and so people were kind of generalizing their skills and improving. Um, maintenance of treatment, DBT more likely to seek individual treatment versus those um, in the control condition, although that's not necessarily fair because part of being in DBT is being in individual treatment. There were more inpatient hospitalization days for controls, but there was no differences in depression or hopelessness. Um, so one of the criticisms of DBT is that it does decrease a lot of these behaviors, but that a lot of the underlying issues like depression and hopelessness um, remain the same. And part of that is because it's, it's often, you know, very few studies actually go into stages two and three when you're working on most, some of those quality of life interfering um, things. At 12 month follow up, Marshall Linehan found that there were good maintenance of treatment gains. So this is not something that's just, you know, while you're in treatment, people did maintain these skills long term.
In another study, Linehan and colleagues did an art randomized control trial of 101 patients with two suicide attempts and self-injury. They compared DBT to community treatment by experts and found that people in the DBT tr condition were half as likely to make future suicide attempts, less likely to be hospitalized, lower medical, medical risk for suicide attempts and self-injury, less likely to drop out of treatment. Um, and in this case, both conditions had significant changes in depression's reasons for living and suicidal ideation. So you can see that again, DBT is very successful in treating a lot of these externalizing behaviors. Now, DBT is also being used in forensic populations, and some of you may be familiar with Dr. Michelle Gallietta's work here at John Jay. She's working with a group of stalkers. She's also developed you know, protocols for um, forensic units and inpatient units on adapting DBT to these types of environments. What we find is there are high instances of, of, P, of personality disorder among the individuals in the, in the forensic population. Um, some of that may be BPD, but it also might be other personality disorders. Um, there's emerging evidence that DBT can also be used with patients with antisocial personality disorder. Um, and you can do uh, treatment similarly as long as you have a clear behavior hierarchy, which we'll go through in a second. Um, so you want to treat you know, life-threatening or aggressive behaviors, and so you, know, you can also treat acting out behaviors for those with ASPD. It can address staff burnout and behavior that interferes with the conduct of effective treatment. So a lot of this stuff is not explicitly addressed in other treatment modalities, but it is in DBT, and so it can be very helpful because a lot of this stuff goes on um, in the correctional setting. And forensic patients are more difficult to engage and have higher attrition rates and poor outcomes, and a lot of this stuff can be addressed as therapeutic interfering behaviors. So this would be a sample um, hierarchy that you could use in um, treating patients in forensic populations, such as decreasing suicidal, parasuicidal thoughts and violent thoughts, as well as violent behavior and urges. So if you're having a lot of acting up behaviors on the unit, um, those would be the first ones that you would target. Then you want to work on behaviors that interfere with therapy. Then you later on you want to do kind of that stage two and three stuff with quality of life issues and increasing behavioral skills. So you can see that it can be very much applied to, to you know, outside of the DBT population. I've put some handouts in your contents folder, and if you're interested, um, both doctors Gallietta and Whooperman are experts in DBT, and both um, Dr. Whooperman actually trained with Marsha Linehan as part of her postdoc, and Dr. Gallietta um, used to work for uh, Dr. Linehan's training organization and still does DBT trainings, and her research is all in DBT. So these are professors who can give you a lot more exposure to this type of intervention because it's being used more and more in forensic settings and more and more in clinical settings as well. So thank you very much.